thank you, Lindsay, for the nice introduction, doing two things at once, letting people into the webinar. And I am also going to go fast because this is a really sophisticated audience. And I think it would be better if we had more time for questions and answers and discussion than rather going through what I'm going to go through, but hopefully it'll be interesting. So I'm going to start by talking about my agenda. I'm going to start with what I call the GBU, the good, bad, and the ugly. Um, then move on to where did we end the spring and then COVID school safety. What are the three things that I, I'm talking about? And with this very uh, important audience, I want to hear if you guys agree with this, but I'll say there are three basics, vaccination, mitigation, and confirmation. And personally, I'll say you need all of them because we're not going to get 100% vaccinated. And even if we did, unfortunately, as great as the vaccines are, they're not 100%. Mitigation, we certainly won't get all of it. So confirmation, i.e. through testing is important. And then we're going to talk about school funding options for testing. And then we're going to go to Karen to um, talk about the specific program with APHA. Does that make sense? You guys good with that? So um, let me start with my, it's sort of an executive summary of the good, the bad, and the ugly. Good cases are way down from a year ago. I wrote that four days ago. Clearly, um, the recent surge is concerning. We're still down, but not nearly as much as we were a week ago. 50% of adults are vaccinated. 80%, the CDC says, for teachers. About a third of 12 to 17-year-olds are vaccinated. And vaccines work really well, 50 to 90%, depending on the variant. And the 50 is J&J &J for Delta. Aren't that many people who have J&J, &J, but that's where we are. What is the bad? Well, some of the same numbers. Only 50% of adults are vaccinated. Um, about net 15% of kids. Um, hopefully that goes up with more approvals. Uh, few mitigation measures are in place. Um, again, that might change in the next couple of weeks, but you'll hear why I think it won't change. And Delta variant is more transmissible than any variant we've seen so far. We can argue about a lot of things, but I'm not sure that one is debatable. And what's the ugly? This isn't about the U.S. or interpretation. There, there are two key things to know. And again, you guys know it. All viruses mutate and there will be more. The question is, are they going to be less virulent or more virulent? And secondly, at least 20%, but I'll tell you, I think 50% of people are completely asymptomatic. So um, shout if you disagree with any of these or, or we can discuss at the end. So if that's the basics, um, where do we go from here? You guys know this, the making of a variant, it starts with a random mutation, one letter, no big deal multiple letters starts to be a big deal. So I highlighted them in colors, variant of note, green, not in and of itself a big deal, variant of interest, orange, and then trouble, a variant of concern in the red. And that's what we have for today, alpha, beta, gamma, delta. I think the next variant of concern will be lambda. So if we take that, what are the five questions to ask around variants? So here are my five. Number one, does it make tests less accurate? Mm, maybe a few, but the FDA is, is working on this. The answer today is essentially none of the EUA tests are less accurate. It does not impact any antigen test because all of the mutations to date have been on the spike protein where the antigens are looking at the nucleocapsid end protein. There are a couple of tests that were affected but they're not looking at one location, so they're still good. Does it increase cases of death? Pretty obvious, the answer is yes. Does it make treatments ineffective? Well, the answer there are some of them, particularly the plasma transplants. If you don't have Delta, if somebody has alpha and a plasma transplant is not gonna work on a Delta patient, we believe. Vaccine effectiveness, I'm gonna talk more about it, yes. And raise the hurdle for herd immunity, yes, yes, yes. Uh, sadly. So that's the first bit of ugly. The second bit of ugly is asymptomatic cases. Again, you guys probably know this, 
but I'll put it together to put all the data in one sheet. Lots of studies here. Um, on the right, too small to read, but 19% is the smallest number. And these were uh, Korean close contacts up to 60% and the Roosevelt. The Diamond Princess was 46%. Um, big, big deal in terms of the number of asymptomatic. These are all adults. But what if we look at kids, because we're talking about K through 12. Two very different studies here, because there haven't been that many on kids. In Seattle, they did community screening, and they found with similar viral loads, kids didn't have the higher viral, lower viral loads. Asymptomatic kids were 38%, which is consistent with what a lot of people say, to say kids are more frequently asymptomatic. In Korea, they found 22% asymptomatic, but importantly, they called these pre-symptomatic. So some of those 38 may indeed be pre-symptomatic as opposed to completely asymptomatic. But the post-infection viral shedding was higher. Are they contagious? Not clear, probably not. So if that's the good, bad, and ugly, where did we end the year? Where do we need to go going forward? And shout if you need me to go slower. Um, so this is returning to classroom from Burbio, which I think is the absolute best source. What you see in the blue line is complete change from virtually everybody being in virtual, excuse me, pun, in virtual, we ended the year, um, you know, through the end of June at 2% virtual, 70% traditional. This is huge progress going forward. And it was pretty much clear across the nation um, some urban districts were less likely to be in person, um, but as you can see, east, west, south, north, virtually all were 80 to 100 percent. California was the only state below 40 percent in person. So I think that's great. Now we've got to figure out a way to safely go back in the fall and not have another challenge that we had before. So if I go back to my basics, I continue to call them vaccination, mitigation, confirmation. So let's talk vaccination first. Um, you probably know these numbers, but I tried to make it easy to read. Um, this is from July 12th. So it's two weeks ago. There'll be another update, uh, I think tomorrow. And what you'll see is the vaccinations are good. What's been nice and you probably know about is the vaccination rates in the last week with all the press around Delta and 60,000 cases have gone up. So you can probably add, depending on the area, a percent or two to these numbers. But what you see here in the 12 to 15 year olds, about 25 percent, um, two shots, 33 percent. And again, round those up just a little bit um, for these last two weeks. But what's interesting is if you look at Israel, roughly four months ahead of us in terms of vaccination rates um, and broad vaccination with their finding, not many breakthrough cases, but they're finding 40% of those are 10 to 19. Now, again, many of these kids will be asymptomatic, hence why we're going to come back to testing, but that it's pretty important to understand this. So you say, oh my goodness, how are we gonna deal with school? Well, just yesterday, a new study came out from the UK. It looked at a hundred high schools. So we're not dealing with the unvaccinated population or not potentially be vaccinated. And they separated the schools into two groups, 76 in what they call the control group versus 86 in the high school. And what they found here, which is really interesting, in the control group, if there was a positive, they quarantined everybody who was a contact without positive. And they found 336 index cases and lost 22,000 school days. Um, in the intervention group, completely you know, matched controls. They had more here. What they did here is they didn't quarantine everyone except for that positive. And what they did is five days of daily antigen testing. And what they found is, what's not clear here, is a 40% reduction, the 18 to 14, um, in days lost. And what's not here is 61% reduction in teachers being out. So testing really worked. Now, quarantine works too. 
However, you lose a lot more school days. And the objective here is to be safe, but also continue teaching. So why is this all important? And why is this UK study that just came out important? Well, A is it covered the Delta period of time. So it included Delta. And what I find scariest of Delta is, you remember Alpha, what seems like way back five months ago? It took three months from Alpha to become the dominant US strain. You could see the beginning of it here. But what about Delta? One month. Literally from June 5th to July 3rd, it got to 51%. And we know in the last data the CDC announced it was 83%. That's why Delta is so scary. But you say, well, people are vaccinated teachers at 80%. In March, the end of March, CDC said the vaccines are 90 plus effective in the real world setting. Mm, true, kinda. But if you look on the right in England, Scotland, Israel, and Canada, you see a reduction in Israel most dramatically to about 64%. In Israel, the alpha mutation, they were running about 99% um, against symptomatic infection. And they went down to 64. They recently updated this, but there's no chart, um, to 39%. Now, it's still highly, highly effective against serious disease and death and hospitalization. But as good as these vaccines are, we've never had a good vaccine, you know, as good a vaccine. You know that everybody's thrilled if the flu works 50% of the time. This is better, but it's not perfect. So if that's vaccination, now let's talk about mitigation. So I'm going to keep going. Raise your hand if you have questions or we can take them at the end. Um, and just a little pictorial here. I think that there are six potential areas for mitigation. I'm going to say, I hope, I hope, I hope, the top line are relatively easy to do. Health checks and making sure nobody's entering the school sick. Hand washing, we should do what our mothers and grandmothers told us to do, wash your hands. And school hygiene, you know, keeping things cleaner than we did in the past. For a lot of schools, that would be the case. So those are kind of easy, and there's not a lot of protests that people are saying don't hand wash. The bottom ones are a lot tougher. The physical distancing, ugh. You know, I don't know how you keep kids six feet apart, much less, you know, three feet apart, much less six feet apart. Surveillance or monitoring, there's some great products out there for air monitoring, but it's not instantaneous, it's a day later. And then the most controversial is masking. So let's talk about masking and where we are today and where we might need to be. I'm sure all of you know, if you weren't watching the Olympics and crying over the US performance, um, what, there are some good ones, but um, what you can see here is just yesterday, the CDC said, um, recommended universal indoor masking for everybody in high risk areas, which is essentially 50% of the US and for all teachers, staff, students, and visitors to K through 12 schools, regardless of vaccination. And I can only imagine they struggled with this because we know we want to give people a benefit for being vaccinated. If you're gonna be vaccinated, you still need to do a mask, why bother? Well, I could argue because you won't die, but um, that is what it is. And they really aggressively said that. But the second thing that's so important is they said, Children should return to full-time in-person learning. And this was very different from what the administrations were saying six months and a year ago. So can you do that? The reality is this is a map that looks at the states and like so many other things, the country's divided. 22% of states are requiring masks and 20% of states are mandated no mask bans. So how do you deal with that? Well, 55% happily are saying it's all about local flexibility. They're not saying you can't, but they're not saying you have to. So a lot of work to be done here in the light green part of the country. Even in the dark green where they're having mass mandates, local areas can suggest it, but they can't require it. How it's gonna deal with this recent Biden administration announcement is not clear. 
Um, but I know at least some states have said, no, we are not going to listen. Um, so for me, when I get to the top line as a check mark, the bottom line is a question mark. Testing remains critical to supplementing any mitigation strategy. So if you take that, to me, it's all about testing, vaccination, mitigation, confirmation through testing. So when I say testing, you guys know this, um, four different ty major types of testing, um, individual PCR, pooled PCR, uh, on-site PCR or molecular lamp um, or isothermal, antigen in the lab, which technically exists, but there are no full EUAs for that, and antigen as a lateral flow or an individual test. So you're also probably familiar with this, but it, you know the decision is not so easy. You've got this balance between sensitivity, specificity, frequency, time to results, logistics, and cost. If nothing else today, um, if you're not aware of it, I'm going to say cost should no longer be an issue. There is a lot of money out there. But why is this important? All of you as public health executives know this, but a lot of our schools don't, which is what is the optimum time to test and why do we need to be doing this testing? And why do we need either immediate testing or through strong PCR, one day turnaround with local labs? It's because you become so infectious very quickly. We can't have three to four day turnaround time anymore. And if you suspect that your the culture of which your kids are living have big Sunday night dinners, don't schedule your weekly testing on Monday because you're not going to pick up the positives. Schedule it on Tuesday or Wednesday um, where you might catch a disease before they're highly infectious. We know it rapidly ramps, but we know that there is no test that can diagnose it at these very early stages. So how does a school do it? You guys you know, work with schools, you're welcome to have these slides. They're posted on the Rockefeller site, but we call it four, four steps, coordination, administration, getting the communication plan. I can't emphasize enough how much that is. Picking the testing modality, if you go with pooled PCR for asymptomatic screening, just making sure you have a follow-up testing process, facility setup, and results reporting. Does it work? Well, the answer is yes. Mathematica did some modeling on behalf of Rockefeller showing that if you test weekly, you go whatever status you're starting with, you reduce the in-school infections by 50%. But what else does it do? The key that it does is increasing confidence. Uh, I won't go through all the, the things on the left because this was a private school and it was small and everybody was thrilled. But let's go to a public school system where it was a little bit more challenging. When teachers were asked, do they want to go back to school and do they have confidence of their safety? Their answer was 14% yes, not a very high number. After implementing testing, the positive went up to 80. Teachers, uh, parents were more positive at 35%. And they went up to 85% after testing. So testing makes the difference there. It's also important, and I'd love to get any other figures that you guys have in your schools, um, but this is what we have for New York City. K through 12.5, positivity rate in the community, 5.6. Teachers positivity, 0.5 across the state, 4%. Last week, I spoke to the El Paso district. 10% um, in the community, 1% in the schools. So we're finding pretty generally the schools are one-tenth of what the community is. So are other states doing it? Again, you guys probably know this, Massachusetts, um, Baltimore, Delaware, California, Ohio, which happens to be a thermo program, very interesting, too exciting, four exciting pilot sites over the summer where the opt-in rates doubled. As people understood, it wasn't very hard. And this was these were challenging test scenarios. The pilots were in schools for the deaf and the blind where there were another, enough other challenges, but it worked well. And now 35 schools have signed up. 
So in summary for me, and then I went through this very quickly, but questions is let me tell you the funding options if you don't know them. Um, I think about it as four options. ESSER is the elementary school and secondary school education resource. Most of this has not been used testing. There are really three programs. The ICAT fund, which is scheduled to close in September, it's pretty limited um, and primarily individual PCR. Then there's Operation ET or the coordination hubs. These were announced about, um, well, two months ago now. They are testing. This is about individual underserved populations, including schools, but also halfway houses, homeless shelters, YMCAs, anywhere that we can catch groups of people, including in schools, but not only schools. The bummer is that this is scheduled to end right now, in November 21, but that I know there's a lot of focus on going forward. Each of the hubs are different, but mostly the hubs decide what testing. The program that we're going to talk about and Karen is going to talk about is the ELC funding for NTAP. This is by far the biggest program. Texas alone has more money in this program than does all of Operation ET. It's 10 billion and it runs till July of 22. It's test agnostic, uh, meaning each school and district can decide which test they want as long as it's consistent with the state program. And this is a lot of debate here um, and people don't believe it, but I can confirm the federal legislation says public, private and charter. So it's not all public schools. Operation ET and expanded testing was originally public schools K through eight, and it's been expanded now to public, private, and charter. So what does that mean for your state? Um, you know, a couple, some politics here, but we'll separate from that. These are the kind of numbers that each state has. So even relatively small states, Rhode Island has 32 million. My state in Arizona has 219 million. There's a lot of money here, state by state by state. And how do you use it? Well, this was a key piece that the Biden administration said on the, this is the same map, except instead of numbered by numbers, it's just by colors. So 85% of these funds need to go to materials, but materials has a broad definition, the kits, the PPE and the staffing. Then the next group goes to services, including sample collection, lab testing. Um, so again, it is broad. You can also spend up to 15% on coordination, technical assistance, monitoring, data collection. So people have asked, how do we use this money? What are the restrictions? We wanted to give you this data. So even if you're getting your testing and it's already working and you're paying for it, but you realize you need somebody to coordinate, um, the federal funds allow that. Now, each state implements it differently. So you'll have to talk to your individual state, but I think it's important to have this context. So in summary, the vaccination efficacy is good, but not perfect. The duration of protection, we don't know. Not everybody will be vaccinated and we know that mutations are coming. So I would say surveillance and testing is critical to avoid recurrence and going back to where we were last year and in the fall in terms of schools. Let's keep the kids there, but use testing to be sure there's nobody in that classroom with COVID. So with that,